Yes. How's everyone doing? Yeah? Okay. Well, I'm Peter Trin. Um, I'm at ICM Partners. Uh, I'm a suit, aka an agent. And uh, right next to me, I have Kevin Lin, who's one of the co-founders of Twitch. Kevin, you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I am not a suit, so I guess I'm a human. Um, uh, so yes, I'm Kevin Lin, uh, co-founder of Twitch. Um, Twitch is a, we, we just announced our new branding at TwitchCon this past weekend. Uh, so we think of ourselves as multiplayer entertainment. Uh, the I, general idea is all, uh, an inter interactive, engaged experience around live video. So it's in the moment, it's appointment viewing, uh, it's highly engaged audience. Uh, it started off in video games. Should I talk about the? Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of the people may not even know what Twitch is. If you were to Google Twitch probably five years ago, you would like, get to like muscle twitches, right? Today, if you type Twitch in, you'll see like a massive, like, you know, plethora of results that like lead to this portal that you're like, huh, what is this site, right? So Yeah, it, it kind of feels like you're just hanging out. Um, so the original concept, well, backing up even more, uh, the website started as a website called Justin TV. Um, and the original concept for that was actually a TV show, hence Justin, uh, which was one of our co-founders, the namesake for the original company, uh, was live streaming his entire life, life casting as we called it back then. And so 24 seven, he was either filming what he was seeing in the world or being filmed and streamed direct to the internet. Uh, that's when he was sleeping, he was working, he was cooking, he was hanging out with people, playing video games, whatever the case may be. And we ended up opening up that platform uh, for a general free to use global live video distribution platform. And uh, that site took off pretty quickly. Um, we made it through the recession 2008, 2009, and we just had all these different people streaming kind of whatever, whether that was uh, themselves talking, like almost like a at-home talk show format. Uh, we had like a bunch of people that um, put cameras on their farms, and so we had like chicken coop cameras. Uh, Mud Truck TV was a popular channel back then. Uh, <laughs> but and occasionally celebrities would use it uh, just to help reach an audience in a different way. And the main takeaway from that was it was a free platform, global, uh, globally distributed, so you could reach anybody in the world just from the safety of your own home. And uh, people told us, a lot of our creators told us, we like it because I feel like I'm with people. I feel like I'm talking to people. We, it is a one-to-many broadcast platform, um, so it's usually a, a single, single camera setup, webcam, picture-in-picture in picture inside of a larger video. That video for Twitch traditionally was video games, and that's changed, I'll talk about that later. Um, but there's chat, text-based chat right next to the video, and that's where the users, the fans, can interact with the broadcaster. So they'll type in something, uh, a question or a request, or just general commentary, and the chat is actually part of the content. So the reason why it all works together largely is because you're observing the actual broadcast, broadcast video coming to your eyeballs, but you're also participating in chat. You may not even participate that much physically, as in you might not be typing, but you're observing what's going on in chat and seeing how the broadcaster interacts with that. Um, then uh, we somehow got the company <laughs> to be profitable through the recession. Uh, it was super cool. Our board was very happy with us. Uh, and then in 2010, in, in the summertime, this game called StarCraft II came out in beta. And somehow we got copies of it. We didn't know anyone in the games industry really back then. Uh, but somehow we got copies to it, and we were playing nonstop in the office. We basically just stopped working and just completely shifted into gameplay mode, uh, uh, much to the detriment of the business itself, and uh, realized that we were going home and watching videos online, whether on YouTube or on other live streaming platforms of people playing StarCraft, particularly some professionals and commentators, so that we could learn how to get better, so we could best each other in combat uh, in the next day. But uh, we finally realized, like, hey, this is actually a behavior. This is a, 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 a cultural habit instilled by uh, basically consoles. So the Nintendo generation, if you think about it that way, uh, had a two-player console in their living room, and you'd go to your friend's house, your neighbor's house, you'd be at school, you'd be in college, and you kind of wait your turn. But when you were waiting your turn, you weren't like, God forbid, you weren't doing homework. You were talking, you were bantering, you were watching each other play. Ditto the arcade. You go to the arcade, you put your, you put your quarter on the, on the glass, and you wait your turn, and you're sizing up your opponent. And that's a, something we've been doing for a long time. And it was, it was one of those proverbial kind of aha light bulb moments. 
And so we put together this <laughs> presentation and went to the board and said, hey, we, wanna, we think we could turn this into the business instead. And they just looked at us like, that idea is just the worst. And we still somehow convinced them to let us try it. Um, and we started reaching out to creators, talking to creators about what their hopes and dreams were. Um, based on that feedback, we built a number of tools for them, inclusive of ways to monetize, and then launched this brand we call Twitch today in June 2011 at uh, E3, which is a big games convention. And then that just started to take, to, to take off. And what you're really watching is people playing video games. That is, that is still something something to this day that people do not believe that people do, but they, they watch each other play video games, sometimes for skill, sometimes for pure entertainment. But really what's happening, that is, I think, one of the most misunderstood things about what happens on Twitch is it's a personal connection. Uh, you feel like you know somebody. You feel like they're bringing you into their lives every day and talking to you, playing games with you, creating content for you, creating art for you. Uh, and so since then, we've extended outside of video games into a variety of things. Uh, so there's this category called IRL, which is kind of back to the OG version of Justin TV, where you're kind of just streaming your everyday life, whether you're just thinking or talking or traveling and walking around a city. But it stands for in real life. It stands for in real life, yeah, um, uh, as opposed to the MTV show, I, which I forget what that stood for. <laughs> um, so we've branched out. We... Uh, had a category called creative, which was all about streaming the artistic process. So whether you're opening up Photoshop and designing something or making music, you can stream that. Uh, we've tested television. We've tested sports with Thursday Night Football with the NFL. Um, so we're really extending the platform. But all along the way, we're thinking about what is this like next style of engagement um, that we can apply to uh, both new and traditional formats. But so that bad idea that you once brought up to your board turned into an almost billion dollar... Kem's being modest, turned into almost a billion dollar acquisition by a small little company called Amazon, right? And you went on to have, the statistics are staggering. So, I mean, I think like, you know, I, I, I know from what I read, but like, you know, for example, you've got over 1 million people watching at any given time, right? Which puts you on par with, you know, cable companies like ESPN or CNN. And your traffic comparison, I know a couple years ago it was reported that uh, you had 1.8% of the U.S. internet peak traffic. So where does that, you know, what other interesting stats can we, like, sort of acknowledge from Twitch? Sure. Um, so we're a globally available platform, except China, um, as Jonathan <laughs> mentioned. Uh, we have about a million people uh, at any given moment on the site, a million concurrent, so that, uh, as Peter said, we're kind of top five-ish TV network if you want to do that comparison. We don't really think that way. Um, uh, and we have about 500,000 500, people every day that create content. And that content creation, unlike a YouTube or something else, is not a post-edited, uploaded thing. You're just sitting and you're doing and you have to get it right, so to speak, because you can't undo it. It's live, it's there, you can't really, there's no rewind button, there's no editing button. Um, and people are watching for about uh, two hours per day. So we're actually, I think we're actually the most engaged platform period in the world on a daily basis uh, in terms of that level of engagement for a singular channel, so to speak. Uh, we have 16 million people a day that come to the site, about 140 million people a month. Uh, that number is very spiky depending on events and game launches and things like that. Um, but the consistency and the level of engagement is very high. So. Uh, over 40% of people are contributing to chat at any given moment. They're talking to each other. A lot of people are playing games together. Um, people are making money on the platform. I think from a user-generated content perspective, we are the highest monetized in, in the West. I'm not uh, sure uh, in terms of comparison to the Chinese platforms. Uh, but Ninja famously, so this is we don't really like to share creator numbers, but since he did it, we'll repeat it. Um, he makes about half a million dollars per month on just Twitch alone. Uh, not counting endorsements, not counting talent appearances, sponsorship deals. He's doing a number of deals these days in music and so on. Um, uh, but he's, you know, he's become sort of this, the ultimate um, role model of how you can build as a creator. I mean, Ninja's been at it for eight years. A lot of people don't realize this. It seems like he came out of nowhere for most people. Like the Drake thing kind of launched him into the mainstream spotlight. You got to remember too, Drake asked to play with Ninja. Not the other way around. It wasn't some crafted PR stunt. 
Drake wanted to reach into this audience and he thought the best way was to play Fortnite, get decent at Fortnite, and play with this dude that he'd probably never heard of before. And so the, but the engagement numbers are, are, are really uh, uh, pretty insane. Has he ever beaten Ninja? I doubt, I doubt it. I doubt he's beaten Ninja. Maybe, maybe Ninja's given him a couple of games, but he's actually pretty good. Um, well, you, you brushed upon it, but I do want to ask this question because I think a lot of people are like pondering this as well. But so I think on around September 21st, it was reported that uh, the light switch got turned off for Twitch in China. So what, how's that had an effect on you and, and, and the firm? And then also, like, what are the plans to re-explore that region? Because obviously, it's regarded that China is the world's biggest gaming market at an estimation of $37.9 billion. So It's definitely a big market. I mean, uh, it's nice to be noticed, I guess. Um, we got shut down about a month ago, uh, officially. We hadn't really committed a lot of resources into China. I mean, we, we had explored a number of conversations out there uh, prior to acquisition. Uh, it's a big market. Uh, we have a lot in, in the industry, and if, uh, we didn't talk about esports much yet, but in esports, uh, which is a very fast growing organized competitive play around video game sector, uh, a lot of the best players in the world are from China for games like Dota, for games like League of Legends. And our fans in, in the West, well, the entire world, they like to watch top players to learn what they do, how they think about the game, and just get to know them as a personality. So it was important for us to, to be able to work with athletes around the world, esports athletes around the world, and give them that exposure. Our whole basic thesis at the time was the better we can kind of storytell and, and develop personal, help develop personalities and expose them to the rest of the world, the faster this esport, esports can grow. It, get, it makes it more aspirational, it provides a deeper connection to the athletes. Um, but it wasn't just about the athletes, everything else, you know, there's a lot of celebrities, internet celebrities that we wanted to, to bring to the rest of the world as well. Um, and that was generally how we thought about it. But from a regulatory perspective, you know, it was, it's tough. It's very tough for a venture-backed company to do business out there, uh, not to mention the competitive nature. I mean, as, as we started to gain in popularity, a number of competitors popped up in China that were funded by the giants, Tencent, et cetera. And so we knew that we would have to have a really like big war chest to compete out there. So we decided not to really do a lot out there. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, seven years went by before we actually got banned. So mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what happened. There's a lot of theories flying around as to what happened, but. Well, one, one of the words that you keep saying, and, uh, you know, obviously is one of the words of the years, and both of our opinions is esports. What, what exactly is it so that everyone understands this? Because obviously gaming, I think everyone understands. And gaming's been around for a very, very long time. But there's this new avenue that's, emerged like even more tremendously in the last few years and mainly in part because of your company but what exactly is esports so esports is uh think of it i think of it as organized competitive play around video games uh it can look and feel a lot like an nfl uh, or an nba where it's structured there's teams uh there are celebrity players there's you know your best your, your sort of mvps um but it's just instead of doing a sport, you're playing a video game. So that's Street Fighter, StarCraft, League of Legends, Dota, uh, Overwatch, number of new games these days. Um, but it really is like just playing in a structured format. Um, it's huge. There's a lot of people around the world that are making real money, real salaries now, are able to sustain themselves. There's entire uh, academic programs um, that are designed around esports now. Uh, schools are really embracing that. Uh, and there are now structured leagues like Overwatch League uh, from Activision where players are guarantee'd a fix a, a, a low sal a low end salary of I believe it's seventy five thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars and, and so there are even arenas right because for example l a for yep are there's an arena in Burbank specifically for overwatch there's an arena being built in Manhattan Beach there's arenas popping up everywhere right yep so the physical infrastructure is getting built that's specific to eSports eSports requires a very reliable internet connection a lot of power et cetera. Uh, it's a, and it's a very different um, production mechanism to, pr to actually produce the shows. Um, but it's a growing industry, and I think there's a, lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in it from sports, music, entertainment. Traditionally, a lot of traditional media companies are investing in uh, creation of, of, of esports leagues and programs. Uh, folks like Robert Kraft and Dan Gilbert and other sports team owners are now buying into the space as well. Uh, so there's a lot of money flowing in, um, and it's a, 
I think the, the, to me, the three main fundamental differences are, it is true, number one, it's truly a global sport. I mean, the, the, there are teams around the world that are meeting on a regular cadence and competing internationally. And that's the expectation of the audience. Uh, two, someone owns the ball, they own the field, they own everything about it. Uh, that's the game company. And so it makes it a little bit, it's not difficult, but you have to really think about longevity, promotion, et cetera, like how do you build this generational sport around a video game? Um, a, a sort of subset of that, that point is games don't necessarily last forever, right? Like, but that's okay. Um, you think about most traditional sports, the rule set actually changes a lot as the meta of the game changes. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of fans don't realize that. So for a game to shift slightly over time is, is actually fairly normal when you think about sports as, as an entertainment product. Um, but the third thing is uh, fans have a very, very deep connection with their favorite celebrities, their favorite athletes. That's something that in the last few years the traditional sports leagues have really learned how to embrace, how to sort of let go and let celebrities use Instagram and Twitter to connect with their audiences. That's very new, actually. And, but for eSports, that's how it started. It started with this direct-to-player connection. Uh, in fact, that was the first connection. The first connection with, with, with the, with the eSport itself is around the player. Okay, first connection is the game, of course, but secondary connection is, is the player. And then eventually leagues were appended on top. Organized play structures were appended on top of that. Um, but celebrity, uh, fans expect to have that depth of connection with the celebrity. Yeah. Well, um, just some interesting t t stats, just so everyone knows, just specific to eSports. According to NewZoo, because this is where the data is coming from, so there are about 380 million uh, global like viewers, essentially. Um, eSports revenue this year, just for 2018, is estimated to be $906 million, which is up 38% from last year. And it's estimated that by 2021, it'll probably approach about $1.65 billion. So it's a pretty crazy like, you know, uh, industry that's growing really, really rapidly. And the, the one thing that, you know, we talked about this, but I found really, really interesting was um, if you were to look at a pie chart where all, where all that revenue from uh, 2018 is estimated to be coming, 38% of it obviously is from North America, and then about 18% of it is from China. So, but one of the biggest things that I thought was really, really interesting about Twitch, and we've talked about it at length, is so I pulled uh, a bunch of data, right? So the most okay, watched cool. Twitch streamers, uh, number one is Fortnite, right? Uh, the highest peak viewership games, and this is for the month of October, uh, number two is Fortnite, number one is League of Legends, probably because the World Championships is going on. Uh, the most watched games on Twitch for this month is Fortnite. Uh, the fastest growing Twitch streamers for uh, October is Fortnite. Um, so, I mean, the reality is, like, if you have kids or younger millennials in your household, you definitely know what Fortnite is. So, how do you explain this phenomenon and, like, you know, uh, how, how does Twitch play into it, too? Yeah, Fortnite, um, so this, uh, it's a battle royale game, which is a relatively new genre inside of the games industry. Uh, it's about five years old. Uh, if you've seen the movie Battle Royale or you've seen, uh, Hunger, seen or read Hunger Games, it's basically that as a game format. People drop onto an island, they go and find weapons, uh, and then it's a last, last player standing model. Um, it's single player, so 100 people drop onto a map, or uh, two, te two player teams or four player teams. Um, but it's one of the fastest growing genres I think we've seen in gaming in a really long time, outside of mobile. Mobile, mobile genre innovation happened actually quite quickly. Um, but from a PC mass adoption basis, uh, it's it's one of, been one of the fastest. Started uh, as a mod. This guy Brendan Green modded Arma 2, this old game Arma 2, into this version. Eventually iterated on that, made another version called H1Z1, which was some former Sony uh, game game execs. Then uh, PUBG came out, uh, which is based uh, a built built by a Korean company. And then Fortnite came out, Epic, uh, which is a company based in North Carolina. And that whole genre went from basically zero players um, to now estimated 50 to 60 million people per day play a game in this genre. More than half of that is Fortnite, so about 32 million people per day are playing this game. And that's just in the West, right? These games are not available in China right now. Well, that, um, that's, that's an interesting thing because, as we know, like um, a couple weeks ago or last week, um, it was reported that China unfortunately stopped the uh, special approval process for games. 
So even without China, Fortnite's still massively huge. Still massive. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the most popular games in China are mobile games. So Tencent's uh, Honor of Kings, Arena of Valor. Uh, the last number I heard was it was at 120 million daily active players. Uh, that's pretty insane. And people are probably playing that game for hours a day. Uh, so it's really taking a lot of your attention span. Um, so Fortnite, PUBG, those games are all mostly dominant in the West. Um, and they're also they're cross-platform. So they're on console, they're on PC, they're on mobile. Um, and it's just become... It's, I don't really know how to describe it. It's a, it's a cultural phenomenon. They built a free game. It's a free game. Anybody can download it for free. And it's a balance game. As in, you don't have to pay to be to win. You don't have to pay, and you cannot buy anything that makes you default at the baseline level better than another player. It's your own skill and coordination and strategy. And yet they make $300 million a month on a free game. And, and that model, the free-to-play model, League of Legends was also free-to-play, and they were making over a billion dollars a year. That model is very new in the West. So League of Legends came out in 2000, really started, started gaining traction in 2011, 2010. And that was one of the first major free-to-play games to come out and taught the Western game development um, community that this actually could potentially work. You still see a lot of resistance from Activision Blizzard. And a lot of big game companies still resist the free-to-play model just because they're so used to the box model. But you're starting to see that change. And so when Epic came out um, really just about a year ago with this format of the game, Fortnite as a brand had existed for a few years before that in a different game format. And it just took off. And mainstream culture just latched onto it. And what's really also interesting about it is from a narrative perspective, a lot of free-to-play games don't really have a lot of narrative. They just, they're meant to churn. They're meant to transact a mass audience, a mass engagement, and just transact free things, whether that's pay to win or just cosmetics. Um, but Epic somehow built this community-driven narrative where they give you these basic elements, character design, things that happen in the world, and then Reddit, Twitter, and everyone else just takes those pieces and tells a story around it. And they don't name things necessarily, but all of a sudden you have this community-driven narrative that they tap into. They listen to that, and, and they alter the game based on that. So things that are happening socially will be incorporated into the game. And that's really cool. That's not something we've really seen at that scale in the games industry. Um, and so there's a, lot of, there's a number of things that are happening around Fortnite that's driving its success. It's also a great game. So. I think we're almost oh. at a, or we are out of time. And so I thought, like, you know, both of us would give a couple final thoughts, right? So Sure. After, oh, um, do you want me to go first or sure. I can go first? So I was just going to say the, the industry is ever evolving. And it's a really exciting time to, like, look into this business. And one of the biggest observations I see is finally kids today having an excuse for not doing their homework. Because when mom and dad come up to them and say, hey, get off the computer or get off the video games, they can reply back, mom, dad, I'm training for my future profession. And I'm going to make more money than Ninja, right? So, but joking aside, I think it's a really, really interesting business. And twos, I think it's even going to get bigger and bigger, obviously. And, you know, for example, publishers are going to look at developing games with viewership in mind because it's becoming more and more interactive to play games and watch games, Thank, thanks in part for companies like Twitch. So, Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's all just getting started. I mean, a lot of the, even the monetization in the space is just getting started around the live, live streaming in general. It's sort of multi-supported. It's advertising, it's direct subscriptions, direct user subscriptions. Um, so there's lots of experimentation going on. We're experimenting quite a bit. Um, but it's definitely a space to watch. Uh, I think, I think uh, to me, like, the most important thing is it brings people together. Like, the best stories we hear are, oh, I made a, I made a friend on Twitch in Japan and in, in Germany, and I've gone to see them, or I saw them at an event, and it was really cool. Like, we actually got along in real life, too. Um, so stuff like that that I think we, we focus a lot on, and I think the industry is starting to focus a lot on around this gig economy, this creator economy. Um, but I do think it's just getting, just getting started. Well, thank Thanks, you for everybody. joining us. Thanks, Peter.